and welcome to Voices of Truth One-on-One -on -one with Hawaii's Future, brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. I'm Ahu Keikahu Cardwell, and here we are today in Waimanalo on the windward side of Oahu. We have an interesting guest on the show, so let's go on over here and meet him. Glenn, aloha. Aloha. How are you? Very good today. Glenn Martinez, did I say your name right? You got it great. Wonderful. And tell us where we are. We're in Olamana Gardens in Waimanalo, Hawaii. Great. And what is Olamana Gardens? We're, we're, we've been a certified organic farm. Uh -huh. We do a, the typical veggies, all that. We do pigs, goats, horses, the whole menagerie. Really? We have about five acres of land here. The land we're standing on is fee simple and that. So that means you actually own the land here in Hawaii. And that, and we're, we have the benefit, we have a running stream, a mountain stream through our property and that, and we live in a rainforest environment. So this is sustainable farming is what it Bingo. is. Bingo. Wow. So can we get a tour of what you got here? You betcha. How about if we okay. go this way? Right on. Look at the fish. So you got fish, you got koi fish, and you got some fast swimming sharky looking things in there called tilapia. They're called koi tilapia. Notice they're kind of orange and black spotted. Uh -huh. Okay, and they're replacing koi fish in a lot of decorative ponds because the joke is you can hardly kill them with a brick. Most of these guys are over 100 years old. 100 years yeah. old? Yeah, most koi wow. fish outlive their owners. When you talk about permaculture, a lot of people, if they wanted a pond, would dig a hole and they would concrete it or do a rubber lining or something. This we didn't. We did a Russian system called glean, where you dig the hole and you spread horse manure or cow manure all over the ground. You sprinkle water on it. It kind of goes green and slimy. You go out with like snowshoes on and you smooth it out like you're working concrete. And then you gently fill it full of water and it self seals. So there's no linings on the pond. They're all natural. So all of our plants are in the ground instead of being in rubber pots and that kind of stuff. And uh, so you do natural. The water comes from a stream about over 100 yards that way. There's a mountain stream that comes through, but it's 22 feet below our feet. In, it's in a ravine. So in permaculture, instead of using a mechanical pump to do it up, when we get over there, you're going to see we use air, compressed air. We raise the water up 20 feet. It flows over here. These guys all swim in it, nice wild water. Then it gravity feeds from here to the duck ponds, which are like 600 feet away, goes over hill and dale, comes up, all the ducks swim in it, and it turns out ducks like to go to the bathroom in the water. Mm. You know, we use toilets, they use a pond. Mm -hmm. And then it flushes from there, it goes through our taro, then to a lotus pond, then it goes back to the stream. Cleaner than when we took it out. And that's the cycle. That's the cycle. And that's perm an example of permaculture. Wow. In other words, build your pond naturally, mm -hmm. don't use a bunch of man-made product, bring the water up as natural as possible using air without all the other mechanical things going don't have electricity down in the stream you know and that right and uh so i started inventing the air pumps and we've got about 14 patent applications in now uh, for air pumps what we did in all our patent applications you know how when you see a movie and it says all rights reserved you read a book and it says all rights reserved all of our patents say we reserve the right to manufacture that's it Everybody else can copy it, make their own, knock themselves out. It'd be like somebody writing a song and say, anybody who wants to sing it is welcome to it. Now, if you record it and make money, I'd like to talk to you. Mm -hmm. But as far as for your own enjoyment, you're good to go. In sustainability, everything you see, my theory on trees is, if you're going to plant a tree, let it be a fruit tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, they all give shade, right? Why not be productive? So we do everything. This is a high quat. It's like a low quat tree. We have mangoes here, black mangoes. You got avocados. We are self-sufficient in that we have a chocolate tree. A chocolate, chocolate tree. tree? Yeah, you want to take a stroll over a chocolate tree? Yeah, let's see the chocolate tree. Yeah. These are chocolate pods up there. No okay. Black pods. And that, and Hawaii has some of the best chocolate in the world. By contest and by blind taste. And some of the best are right here on this island, out on the North Shore. So those pods right up there those pods up contain there. chocolate. Chocolate. So we have a company right here in Kailua that comes out here twice a year, and they teach a class for like $50 to the public, and they totally subscribe. And you come out here, they open up the bean, they ferment the bean, you come back the next weekend, and we go all the way, they call it from tree to chocolate candy bar. I'll be and gone. you go home with four chocolate bars that you melted, you put in the coconut or whatever you wanted to do to flavor, and you bring your chocolate home. 
Mine didn't even make it upstairs. I was going to say. Yeah, so, mine, did, mine yeah. had a short life. I wouldn't be leaving here with four chocolate yeah. bars. Well, I mean, yeah. I'd be leaving here with them, but they'd be right yeah. here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. it. We have the koi fish pond, and the trick is you want to be able to change the water out, normally 10% a day in normal aquaculture kind of situation. So in this white pipe here, it's just about six inches above the ground, the water flows out to the rate of about 450 gallons an hour. And that water, we're going to follow it. We've just left the pipe laying on the ground so people can see where it comes from. We're going to walk over to the bridge where we pump it up. We're going to follow the white pipe. Follow the white pipe. Okay. Like the yellow brick road kind okay. of thing. Okay. Yeah. So we go by the chocolate tree and then bamboo. We grow 18 different kinds of bamboo on the property. You can have it as thick as a fence or like over there, big timber bamboo. Wow. And here's okay. the white pipe right here that yep. we're crossing. So we follow the white pipe, and this is so low pressure, this is not even glued together. And there is the white pipe yep. right there. So here's a little air pump, uh -huh. and the little air pump comes over here. Oh, look at this. And I'll get oh that out of the way. And I'll pull this lid off here, step back this way just okay. a little bit. We'll see if I have any luck at all today. Uh, this is air pumping up the water from the stream down below. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. You notice how many bubbles are in it? Yeah. So it's super aerated. Yes. So it pumps out up here. This collects it. Now it falls down in here, comes down this pipe, and voila, hooks to the two inch pipe and goes over to the koi fish. Is that right? Wow, that's So we can amazing. pump this up with a 60 watt pump, 450 gallons an hour. Is that right? And pump it up 24 hours a day. So in the daytime, it runs on the solar panel at the end. At nighttime, it switches back to Hawaiian Electric. No batteries, no moving parts, and you just have a little air compressor. So we do different varieties of these things here. This one down here, one of my first inventions, the burper pump. And this one takes that stream water and it burps it up. It's only about 150 gallons an hour, but it's kind of cool, huh? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Where was that when I was a kid? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They say boys like to play with water or fire, and if they can do both at the same time, you know. So much the more better. Fun. I think that's why we have firemen. Huh? That's right. Yeah. And that. And that one runs off a quiet little outdoor, and feel this, just hums. Quietly humming along. How I put them it? in classrooms and no objection at all. Yeah. Yeah. And we just run it off this little 240 watt panel. No kidding. So I only have 100 watts of pump out here and I have a 240 watt panel. So wow. way overpowered. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Oh, look at this out here. My goodness. There you go. Wow. Look at this. So we've learned that if you have something that wants to climb up, let it climb up and over here. We made the mistake of having it over the garden and it smothered its own garden. Mm -hmm. It killed itself off. So here we have tomatoes coming up in this, and this is aquaponic. We have fish tanks up at the hill. We're gonna walk up and look at them. Okay. So we have a, two 1,200 gallon tanks. Each uh, one has about 1,000 fish. Up the hill. Up the hill. Uh -huh. The water gravity feeds out, goes to the cinder beds. Up there we see all those plants. Yes. Those are the biological filters. Worms live in them and that, and all that stuff grows. And it works its way down, so fish tank, center bed, then float bed, and then it goes to the sump tank and one pump. So we have a saying, one pump, one God, one love. My wife threw that in. One pump. Wow. So, so this yeah. is self-cleaning and self-cleaning. Self and it just runs 24 hours a day and you run it off a solar panel. Wow. Yep. And wow. so this is what I travel around the world doing. I've gone to San Juan, last, San Juan, Puerto Rico last week. Before that, it was American Samoa, Fiji, Tonga. I go to the Philippines about twice a year with the Consuelo Foundation sends me there. And when I go for 21 days, I will move every three days starting a farm. Then you come back in six months and you do any troubleshooting, any fine tuning, and normally it blows your mind away. You leave them a little demo and you come back and it covers an acre. Hmm. I mean, once they latch on to the, the process, they take it from there hmm. and it takes on a life of its own. So you're more like a Johnny Appleseed kind of character. Yeah. You don't have to hang around and raise them. Just plant seeds. You just seeds. get credit for planting the seed. Yeah. You I know, I kind of yeah. like that. We pioneered a lot of different things here. One is at the University of Hawaii, two professors in 1997 got a patent on something called aeroponics. 
And that's where they found out if you had a container, let's say even a trash can, and you put a gallon or two of water in it and you put nutrition into it, the water would evaporate up into that space. And because the lid was on it, they couldn't get out. If you drilled four holes and started tomato plants, in about a month when you peeked under the lid, you couldn't see across it. All the roots would be hanging in the air that the nutrition came up in the moisture. So what we do now is we use boards like this. We came up with doing the aeroponics. The board sits over top of the water and the roots hang down in the water. Hold on, pull that up yeah, one let more me, time. Let's, let's do this one. That. This one's over here, you see the handle? Oh, look at that, wow. So this is your mass of roots. You wanna see white roots? I don't want white hair, but I do want white roots, uh -huh. you know? And that, and the plant just grows up there nice and healthy. The water, smell my hand, there's 1,200 fish in this system. Wow. But there's no fishy odor or anything to it. So we can set plants out and they'll just take right off. We set them in these little pots and now the roots will start coming out here and bush out. This has been out for two days. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And so it grows. So in aquaponics, which is the art of raising fish in, a, in some kind of enclosure, having the water go through some kind of biofilter where the ammonia gets changed to nitrogen, it could be rocks, marbles, clay balls, whatever. And then we go to float beds, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, if I have a 1,200 gallon tank, I get to have 1,200 square feet of intensive gardening. And on the average, anybody in aquaponics grows eight times more food in the same square footage. Mm -hmm. And we only use 5% of the water because we use the same water over and over as opposed to irrigating and saying goodbye to it. So we get to grow all these different kinds of things. Amazing. So on a Hawaiian thing, see the taro over there? Yes. Okay. There's a problem in Hawaii, continuous shortage of taro. It's, so we found out that when they plant a taro plant, it takes a year for it to mature, and you get to harvest it, and you get three babies. Okay. We found out in aquaponics that it's great as a nursery. We put three adult plants in here in the center, and we have all of these babies here. You can look at that one over there. That's at six months there. Wow. So I have over 125 plants in there, which we now will bubble up. We flood it with water. We stick an air wand. We bubble them up. We take them out without damage in the roots, and that will spread out and cover a quarter acre of ground. Wow. You know, you couldn't possibly raise them up in there. They'd mm -hmm. choke themselves out. Sure. But, sure. Uh, but for propagation, something about the taro loves, it just starts making babies. Mm. You know, and then you want to move, it's a field crop, so you need to move it out. But for us, we grow onions. Oh kale. yeah, green onions, look at that. Yeah, okay. green yeah. onion, comfrey. Yep. We do a lot of kales. And see these blossoms, squash blossoms? Look at that. Now the blossoms are so delicious in some of these plants, we keep frying up the blossom. Well, it means you don't get the squash, but yeah. there's trade-offs in life, yeah? That's right, that's yeah. right. But we do a lot of this, this is um, uh, squash, uh-huh. Boy, that's a lot of yeah, squash. Yeah, a lot of squash. So, there that, we go. And this is known in 87 different languages. This is a Filipino favorite. The Filipino people come here, they tend to leave like this with a whole pile of them in, their, mm -hmm. in the dress of their blouse and that. And, uh, but it's just a wonderful, you make everything from apple pie to eggplant parmesan out of it. How about that? Very, very versatile plant. So it grows everywhere. You, that you can. So inside here are our fish tanks. Oh, there are the fish. Wow, mm -hmm. big ones. Mm -hmm. Look at that. How many fish you got in here, Glenn? Normally 800 to 1,000 of them at any given time. And that, and they'll eat their babies. So. When we want to breed them, we put them over here in a little tank to keep them from getting beaten and harassed uh -huh. and that. And, uh, but you raise them up to here on this side over here. Glenn, what kind of fish are these? All tilapia. All tilapia. Yeah. Wow. And if you come around this side, you'll be able to see into the water because the light's behind us. Yes. And let me just knock off the air rat fast for us. By doing that, it'll go still for you. You come around here, the camera will be able to see right down to the fish. Look well, at that, wow. A little fish sells for $5 a pound. Mm -hmm. 
gets larger, it sells for $6 a pound. These monsters sell for $8 a pound. Mm. So a three pound fish is $24 to me. And you notice we have some koi tilapia. Those yes. are the spotted ones. Yes. We started crossbreeding them. And there are a lot of people think they're koi because of the colorfulness. But you notice it's hard to see my dark fish in a dark tank, right? Yes. Yes. So it's, you can see better when they're red. Now the red ones are called the Waianae Hawaiian Sunfish, which is creative marketing. Because here in Hawaii, they have a stigma against tilapia, not found anywhere else in the world. They're invasive. Yeah, yeah. They brought them here, the Department of Agriculture, the story goes, to eat the grass in the irrigation ditches. And nobody fed them. So they just lived on what they could get. And there was a lot of chemical water going down those ditches, mm -hmm. all the runoff. So when you tasted them, they were foul. We take our fish out, and they're fresh. My water, do you feel it? Feel this. It's not slimy. Yep. It's not fishy. And yep. smell it. Okay? No sense. And you have over 800 fish here. Wow. That's yep. amazing. If you're going to be a fish farmer, the one thing you got to do is have fish food. We raise azola, and we raise duckweed. Wow. Ready for this? 35 to 40 percent protein. And we eat it right out. It's crunchy. Eat it right on your salad. Eat it right on a sandwich. Wow, that's good. Grown in city potable water. 35 to 40 percent protein. This can feed the world. Feeds my fish, feeds my goats, feeds my chickens and my ducks. And you, and me. And me. That's How it. about that? Yeah, it's bright and it's fresh. You lay a stick in here and you pull it over to one hair and you harvest that out. You come out tomorrow morning and it's full again. People say, what do the fish eat? Well, they eat the azola that grows in what? Fish water. Huh? The fish eat this, they fertilize the fish water and it comes back. The same way in the dairy, you would take all the cow manure, compost it, and go out and put it back out in the pasture. So this is right? a compost. It's a compost. And wow. that's, that's permaculture wow. in a nutshell. A continuous life cycle that you could do forever. Wow. Right? And when we do sustainable, it sometimes gets confused with another S word, which is subsistence. Permaculture is not subsistence. It's not barely getting by. In fact, one of their mantras is, you must have a surplus. Because, sure, you grow your own food, but you still got to pay property tax. You still got to pay the electric company. You still, at the grocery store, it's hard to barter everything, right? Right. So you need to have a surplus. Why don't we see more of this going on in Hawaii today? Well, you ready for this? Hawaii is the leading place. We have 22 commercial farms in Hawaii. Okay. We are the training place on the Big Island up to here. We just did five men from Rhoda who have been nicknamed the Magnificent Five. You go up and look at the Rhoda website and that, you'll see that they spent three months living here on my farm, training here on the farm, six hours a day. At the end of the, the toward the training, the last six weeks, you get tired of the whole lecture thing. You know, sitting in a lecture hall, it's just as hard for the instructor as it is mm -hmm. the student. So we put the word out that all of Monte Gardens, with their magnificent five Rota team members, that we would go build an aquaponic system for anybody who supplied the parts and bought lunch. Gotcha. We went to the Big Island, Maui, and we did about eight of them here. We built some for University of Hawaii. But if anybody, any school, nonprofit, anything, if you bought the materials, we do it. So we left here every day. We leave when we couldn't see in the dark. We see, you leave from can't see, and we stayed out till you couldn't see. We left in the dark and we came out in the dark. But at the end of the six weeks when the men graduated, and this is a University of Hawaii program, and we sent them back to Rhoda, they got funding and built a community aquaponics thing, and now they're training. And they're nicknamed there. Nobody dreamed it up, by the way. They just came up, it surfaced, the Magnificent Five. And now they have jobs, and they're teaching the island of Rhoda, where they import 92% of their food. Mm -hmm. You've heard that story. Similar numbers here in Hawaii, right? But they don't have as many jack-in-the-boxes and Burger Kings as we do. Mm -hmm. There's a little more element of urgency there. So they were able to bring this back, you know, to there. So yeah. your small island, scarce resources, water's always a problem. So aquaponics was a natural fit. Wow. Glenn, what can something like this do for food sovereignty? Especially uh, for an island. Uh, it's great for an island mentality. Where I get the, our biggest challenges that we love is I go to the worst places, to a desert or to where it's frozen. All the way down to the South Pole. The University of Arizona built a CEA, Controlled Environment Agriculture. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they brought it down to the South Pole to feed the men that work in the South Pole. Really? In a controlled environment. You go up to University of Arizona, 
CEA, Controlled Environment Agriculture. Now, as soon as you put up a greenhouse, as soon as you put up a wind block, as soon as you put up a shade structure, you're controlling your environment, right? Yeah. So now I'm doing a, a project over in uh, Shandong, China. They're building an educational greenhouse, 45 by 75 feet, all computer control with the weather station on it, open and close and adjust itself. We have them down at Disneyland, Epcot Center. Mm. They're kind of copying that a little bit, you know? Mm. But what a show place. The Chinese have really embraced it as what they call a cross-platform training to get the math teacher, the biology teacher, and in engineering to talk to each other. It's not that they're crazy about aquaponics, but can you think of another darling little project that has fluid, water, air, all the engineering, and at the end of the week, you get a meal. Wow. Why hasn't something like this literally taken over Hawaii? Why don't we see it everywhere? Why isn't this the dominant way we get our food today? Well, because I think, in the bottom line, I don't think our government is interested in us, you and me, growing our own food. In fact, if I came out with a program that taught the citizens of Hawaii to grow 25% of their food, and that meant that Safeway, Foodland, et cetera, would sell 25% less, and that Matson Company would ship 25% less, I would have to find a secret place to live. <laughs> They're happy with me teaching the underprivileged. They're happy with me teaching it as a hobby. But if you start teaching that it will cut down on the actual imports, quite frankly, I don't think anybody wants to upset the going money trail that we're on. So are you telling me that this has no chance of catching on? Ah, oh, the grassroots are doing it. Look at organic gardening. Yeah. I would. I heard about it in the 70s, yeah. played with it in the 80s. Yeah. In 96, I buy this place, and I, we were certified organic, you know, and we love organic. Great stuff, right? And now look at it. Corporate America now has embraced it. Walmart's gone over it. It takes time. So this is like that slow burn. I'd like it to explode. I'd like it to be a wildfire, a brush fire, right? But it's more of a slow burn. But it is the fastest growing agriculture in the world. Wow. The yeah, fastest? Around the world. Fastest growing agriculture in the world. In the in world. world. Yep. And it saved aquaponics here. I mean, aquaculture. Aquaculture was kind of having a, just going down. The university, the number of professors were down. They were down to about eight students and three mm -hmm. professors. Aquaponics popped up about five or six years ago. Now they got 70 to 80 students. Now they're fully funded. It's just a little more than growing fish in a, in a tub. Mm -hmm. When you grow fish in a tub, you got to wait eight months a year for anything. And this, we started this on March the 1st, five years, six years ago. Channel 4 News was out here 18 days later, and they ate out of the garden <laughs> in 18 days. Now, what else can you do for that? That's yeah. wonderful. It's been wonderful to come yeah. up and see what you're doing here at Olamana Farms. Yeah. Fantastic. So we appreciate it. And to our viewers, mahalo for joining us on this special edition of Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's Future. Remember, you can watch us on the web 24-7 on VoicesOfTruthTV.com. I'm Ahuke Kahu Cardwell for the Kiwani Foundation, and until next time, ahui ho! Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. Watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. You'll find all our shows, including this one, in case you want to see it again or share it with family and friends. Also, view our weekly video commentaries at FreeHawaiiTV.com. And check out our blog, published daily, at FreeHawaii.info. It's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network.